the life of plato by olympiodorus translated by george burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards come then let us speak of the family of the philosopher not for the sake of prolixity but of benefit rather and instruction to those who betake themselves to him for he was not a nobody but rather to many of mankind he was a care for plato is said to have been a son of his father ariston the son of aristocles from whom he carried up his family to solon the lawgiver and hence he wrote in imitation of his ancestor the laws in twelve books and a political constitution in eleven he came into the world by his mother perictione who was descended from Neleus, the son of Codrus. For they say that Apollo, in a vision, had an intercourse with his mother, Perictione, and appearing in the night to Ariston, ordered him to have no connection with Perictione until the time of her bringing forth. And so he acted. And his parents, taking him after his birth, and when he was still an infant, placed him on Mount Hymettus, intending to make a sacrifice to the deities there, namely Pan and the nymphs, and Apollo, who presides over shepherds. But while he was lying there, bees came and filled his mouth with honey from the comb, in order that it might be said truly of him, From his mouth flowed a voice than honey far more sweet. And he calls himself on every side and a fellow-slave with the swans, as if he had proceeded from Apollo, for the bird belongs to Apollo. In early life he first went as a pupil to Dionysius the grammar-master, to learn the common course of instruction, of whom he has made mention in the rivals, in order that Dionysius might not be without a share of remembrance on the part of Plato. After him he made use of Ariston the Argive, as his master in gymnastics, by whom, as they say, his name was changed into Plato, having been previously called Aristocles, after his grandfather. And he was called Plato from his having two parts of his body very wide, namely his breast and forehead, as his likeness proves, put up everywhere with such a representation. But others assert that it was not for this reason his name was changed, but on account of the breadth and diffuseness and openness of the style adopted by him, just as they say that Theophrastus, who was previously called Trutimus, had his name changed to Theophrastus on account of the divine nature of his language. For his music master he had Dracon, the pupil of Damon, of whom he has made mention in the Republic. These were the three things the boys at Athens were taught, I mean grammar, music, and wrestling, not simply for themselves, but grammar to embellish the language natural to them, music to tame violent passions, and wrestling and gymnastics to strengthen the relaxed state of desire. In these three points Alcibiades appears to have been instructed by him, and hence Socrates says to him, But to play on the pipe you were not willing. And what follows? Plato went likewise to painters, from whom he derived some benefit in the mixing of colors, of which he has made mention in the Timaeus. Subsequently he received instructions from the writers of tragedy likewise, who were considered to be the instructors of Greece, and he went to them for the sake of the moral and solemn style of tragedy, and the heroical nature of their subjects selected by them, and he made an acquaintance with the dithyrambic poets, for the honour of Dionysus, who is said to be the superintendent of generation, for to that deity the dithyram is sacred, from whom likewise it had its name, for Dionysus is dithyrambus, as having proceeded from two doors, namely Semele and the thigh of Jupiter. 
for the ancients were wont to call things caused by the names of the causing, as they call Dionysus likewise, and hence Proclus says on this subject, Parents, from what they see and know, upon their children names bestow. Now, that Plato exercised himself in dithyrambics is evident from the Phaedrus, a dialogue that breathes very much of a dithyrambic style, inasmuch as Plato wrote, as reported, that dialogue the first. He took likewise great delight in Aristophanes, the comic writer, and in Sophron, from whom he benefited in his imitation of the characters in his dialogues. And he is reported to have been so delighted that, when he was dead, copies of Aristophanes and Sophron were found on his couch, and he made himself this epigram upon Aristophanes. The Graces, when they wished to find a shrine that should forever live, said what they sought alone the mind of Aristophanes could give. And he made fun of Aristophanes in his dialogue called The Banquet as having derived some benefit in the style of comedy. For, after making him him the god of love, he introduces him as seized during the conversation with hiccups, and unable to finish the hymn. He composed likewise tragic and dithyrambic poetry, and some other things, all of which he burnt after he had made a trial of an intercourse with Socrates, and pronouncing a verse of this kind. Come here, Hephaestus, Plato needs thy aid. And a certain Anatolius, a grammarian, on speaking again the verse, was in some repute with Hephaestus, who had been appointed governor of the city. For he said to him, Come here, Hephaestus, Pharus needs thy aid. They say, moreover, that when Socrates was about to receive him as a disciple, he saw, as a vision in a dream, that a swan without wings had settled on his knees, and, becoming fledged on the instant, flew up to the sky, and sung something so sweet that he enchanted all who heard it, and this indicated the future fame of the man. But after the death of Socrates, he again made use of Cratylus, one of the sect of Heraclitus, as his teacher, on whom he composed the dialogue of that name, inscribing it Cratylus, or on the correctness of names. Afterwards he sailed to Italy, and finding that Archytas had established there a school of Pythagoreans, he again had as a teacher the Pythagorean of the same name. There he has made mention of Archytas. But since it is requisite for a philosopher to be fond of seeing the works of nature, he sailed to Sicily likewise to view the craters of fire that are in Etna, and not for the sake of a Sicilian table, as thou, noble Aristides, sayest. And when he was at Syracuse with Dionysius the Great, he endeavoured to change the tyranny there into an aristocracy, for which purpose he had gone to him, Dionysius, and on the latter inquiring of him, Whom do you think amongst men is happy? Fancying, forsooth, that the philosopher would, out of flattery, say that he was, Plato answered that he thought Socrates was. And when Dionysius asked him again, What do you consider as the business of a statesman? Plato replied, To make the citizens better. And when he asked a third time, What then? Does it seem to you a little thing to act the judge correctly? For Dionysius had a reputation for acting the judge correctly. Plato replied, not lowering his sail a jot, It is indeed a little thing, and of a statesman the farthest portion, for they who act the judge correctly are like the menders of cloth who weave up again torn garments. And when he asked a fourth time, what is it, think you, to be a tyrant? Is it not a brave thing? Plato replied, Of all the most cowardly, since he fears even the razor of the barber, lest he should lose his life by it. Whereupon Dionysius, being greatly annoyed, ordered him, while the sun was still above the earth, to take himself off from Syracuse, and thus was Plato, with dishonour, 
driven out of Syracuse. Of his second journey to Sicily, the reason was this. After the death of Dionysius the Great, Dionysius, the son of Dionysius, succeeded to the kingdom, having Dion for his uncle, who had been a familiar acquaintance of Plato during his first journey. Dion therefore writes to him, saying that, if you were now present, there would be a hope of changing the tyranny into an aristocracy. For this purpose, then, when he had made a second journey, he was falsely accused by the spear-bearing attendants upon Dionysius, how that he was plotting to make over the government to Dion, and to depose Dionysius, when, being overpowered, he was by Dionysius delivered over to Polis of Aegina, who was then trading with Sicily, to be sold. And he, carrying Plato to Aegina, found there an Icaris, the Libyan, who was about to sail to Elis for the purpose of entering the contest with a four-horsed car. And, meeting with Polis, he purchased Plato from him, having bought this glory superior to all the victory of a four-horsed car, respecting whom Aristides says that no one would have known Anicares if he had not purchased Plato. Of his third journey to Sicily, this was the motive. Dion, after being prescribed by Dionysius and deprived of his property, was thrown into prison. He writes, therefore, to Plato that Dionysius had promised to release him if Plato would come to him again, when he readily undertook this third journey to assist his friend. And thus much on the travels of the philosopher to Sicily. It should be known likewise that he went to Egypt to the men of the priesthood there, and learnt from them the science of a priest. Hence he says in the Gorgias, No by the dog, which was a god in Egypt, for that which statues mean amongst the Greek, animals do amongst the Egyptians, through being the symbols of each of the gods to whom they are dedicated. Being desirous, moreover, to meet with the Magi, but unable to reach them in consequence of a war raging at that time in Persia, he departed for Phoenicia, and meeting there with the Magi, he obtained the science of the Magi, and hence he appears in the Timaeus to be skilled in the art of sacrificing, while speaking of the signs of the liver and entrails, and such like matters. But this ought to have been told previous to the statement of the causes of his journeys to Sicily. On his return to Athens, he established a school in the Academia by separating a portion of the gymnasium for a grove sacred to the Muses, and there Timon, the man-hater, associated with Plato alone. Very many persons did he attract to learning, both men and women in male attire, by preparing them to hear him, and showing them that his philosophy was superior to all love of business. For he freed himself from the irony of Socrates, and from passing his time in the place of public meeting, and at workshops, and from composing discourses to catch young persons. He freed himself likewise from the Pythagorean oath about keeping their doors closed, and the, he said it, and exhibited himself more like a citizen to all. After making many his admirers, and benefiting the most of them, when he was about to die, he had a dream how that having become a swan, he went from tree to tree, and caused the greatest trouble to bird climbers. This Simeus, the Socratic philosopher, expounded by saying that he would be not caught by those who after him wished to interpret him, for the interpreters who wanted to catch the meaning of the ancients were like bird limers, and not caught he is, since one may take his words, like those of Homer, in a sense physical, moral, ethical, theological, and, to speak simply, in a variety of senses. For these two souls are said to be altogether in harmony, and hence one may take them both in various senses. After his decease, the Athenians buried him in an expensive manner, and they inscribed upon his tomb. These two, Asclepius and Plato, did Apollo beget, 
one that he might save the soul, the other the body. And thus much respecting the family of the philosopher. End of The Life of Plato by Olympiodorus and End of Apocrypha by Plato Translated by George Burgess Read by Geoffrey Edwards Proof listened by David Craig